Hello, this is Mr Rowe and welcome to my whistle stop tour through the communicable diseases topic for AQA GCSE. First of all, a little teaser for you. What do you think all of these events have in common with one another? World War One, the Vietnam War, the 9-11 attacks and the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Have you got it yet? The thing they have in common is all of these events almost pale into, into insignificance when they're compared to the death toll from communicable diseases. There are four main categories of pathogen you need to know about which cause disease. All of these are microorganisms so are far too small to be seen using just the naked eye. You've got protoctists, bacterial diseases, fungal diseases, and finally diseases caused by viruses. For bacterial diseases, let's have a quick look at a bacterial cell. Around the outside of the cell, you have the cell wall. In bacteria, this is made from peptidoglycan. Just inside that, you've got a cell membrane. In the interior of the cell you have the cytoplasm, where all the chemical reactions take place. You have two types of DNA. You have a large loop of DNA, which contains most of the genetic material, and you also have plasmids. These are small loops of DNA, which can be swapped between bacteria to exchange genes. And finally, the little red splodges there are the ribosomes. These are the protein factories of the cell where protein synthesis takes place. Now for some of the diseases which are caused by bacteria, start off with some fairly mundane ones. Most food poisonings are actually caused by bacteria. The main culprit is often the bacterium E. coli, which can cause a lot of food poisoning by producing toxins. Next we've got tuberculosis, often known as TB. This is a lung infection. At the moment it's largely confined to the third world, but we're going to be hearing more and more about it as it becomes resistant to drugs and is starting to move into other countries. MRSA is an example of a superbug, a hospital-acquired resistant infection which doesn't respond to antibiotics. It can cause blood poisoning or septicemia, and it can cause other complications such as skin infections. And finally, the big one, we've got the Black Death there. In the 14th century, the Black Death is estimated to have killed somewhere between 50 and 60% of the population of Europe. So with bacteria, the way they cause disease is through rapidly reproducing, creating copies of themselves through cell division and also by releasing toxins, that is substances which are poisonous to the host cells within your body. Moving on to viruses, viruses aren't actually cells, they're really really simple. All they have is two layers, they have a protein envelope on the outside. On that protein envelope they have different types of protein which can sometimes change. This is why you get different strains of viruses which cause disease at different times. In the centre of the virus particle you have all of its genetic material in the form of nucleic acids. This is either DNA or it can sometimes be RNA in viruses which is an even a simpler molecule. For some diseases caused by virus You've got the common cold, HIV AIDS, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, uh, suppresses the immune system, so it means you get ill from other secondary infections. The Ebola virus, which has been in the news a lot recently, causes hemorrhagic fever and is highly, highly fatal. And lastly, epidemic influenza. The one the poster's for is Spanish flu. This hit just after the end of World War I, 
and across Europe it caused the death of 50 million people. That's around 20% more people than were actually killed during the First World War itself. Now there's a couple of reasons why it's really hard to treat viruses. The main ones are, they're not killed by antibiotics, those only affect bacteria. And secondly, the, viruses, the virus particles are able to enter cells. Once they're inside a cell, they can hide from your immune system, so they're very hard to remove from the body. Now for diseases caused by fungi. A fungus cell has a cell wall on the outside. This time, it's made from a substance called chitin, so it's different to plant and bacteria cell walls. Inside that, there's a cell membrane. It then has cytoplasm again for chemical reactions. It has ribosomes to produce proteins. A nucleus, which contains its DNA, so the same as in an animal or plant cell. It's another example of a eukaryote. And finally, it has mitochondria, which I'm highlighting in blue. The mitochondria are where aerobic respiration happens, producing energy in the cell. Diseases caused by fungi aren't quite as common as some of the other pathogens that you come across. Some examples you may have heard of are athlete's foot, which you get between your toes. Ringworm, which despite its name is actually a fungal infection and has nothing to do with a worm at all. And farmer's lung. As well as causing disease in humans, you'll also need to know a bit later about how fungi can cause disease in plants. One good example of this is black spot, which is damaging to roses. Now for a disease caused by the fourth type of pathogen, a protoctist. This one is malaria, and it's caused by a protoctist called plasmodium. The way you get plasmodium is from a mosquito bite. In its saliva, the plasmodium gets into your bloodstream and can then be passed on to another mosquito, helping to spread the disease if you get bitten by a second insect. Once inside your bloodstream, the plasmodium is able to go inside red blood cells where it makes lots of copies of itself and causes damage. The reason why there's no cell shown for this is protoctists are quite a large group. They're just any pathogen which doesn't fit into any of the categories you have to learn about. Thank you for listening. And if you haven't quite picked all of that up, feel free to watch through the video again.